And it can sound so abstract and like elusive, like, oh, okay, you're going to develop your intuitive abilities and how do you become an HSP? Or people ask me, how do you start to channel and all of these things? It's actually quite straightforward. It's being able to identify the information that is right there in front of you that you usually tune out. Welcome to the Deja Vu podcast, where we believe that living a life of magic can be the default. Join us each week as we playfully and authentically dive into the mysteries of life and explore what it truly means to be human. From spirituality, wellness, and all things to boo, we don't hold anything back. So without further ado, let's let the magic unfold. Today's episode is sponsored by Becoming with a Q. So Becoming is a space for community to come together and to realign what it truly means to be you in the full entirety of yourself before you were told who you were meant to be. This is connecting with the essence of who you've always known yourself to be, but being held in a community of individuals that are pioneers, creating an ecosystem to reflect back to you all of the blind spots to create a structure that allows you to genuinely build an authentic life from the foundation up. Becoming host retreats all around the world, also an online community, trainings, and so much more. I truly believe in becoming with my whole heart and soul because I have had the blessing to be able to walk very intimately with the founders of Becoming, Benjamin and Azra, who have single-handedly changed the entire course of my life, aligning me with the prosperity that I have always known is possible, but have never been reflected it through my immediate environment until meeting them. It is truly an honor and I am so excited that the Deja Blue podcast is partnering with Becoming because it is a place that all of the information that can be absorbed from the Deja Blue podcast can actually be put into real tangible action steps and allow you to build a life from the inside out that actually resonates with your own heart frequency of truth. The next offering for Becoming is a four week online program called Becoming Prosperous. Aligning ourselves from the inside out with a truly prosperous life and actually learning to understand what prosperity really even means. It goes so far beyond just our finances. Truly recognizing that prosperity lives within our immediate friends, how we serve our community, our service to the world, our relationship with our finances, our relationship with our body, our relationship with the earth, and recognizing that how we do anything is how we do everything. And so this four week course is going to be breaking it down right to the bare basics and allowing ourselves to rebuild a life of true prosperity. So if you want more information about it, go check out the link in the show notes. And without further ado, welcome to today's episode. Hello, beautiful beings, and welcome back to another episode of the Deja Blue podcast. We have a recurring guest on today's episode. It's very exciting. Um, Hello, Aston has been on the episode before, (laughs) back in my old house, where we navigated the realms of everything between breath and octarians and all of the notes in between the two topics. Um, we went there and this is a, a sister, a little, this is a sister that is not afraid to go there with me. And they're the kind of relationships I want in my life where I can communicate with just a single look. It's a little bit like that quote from Bridesmaids where she's like, um, <laughs> but I, every time I'm in the space with Hella, I feel like there is an unspoken agreement that we have each other's backs no matter what. And there is also an understanding of navigating the realms that are not just the ones that we pick up with our five senses, but the unspoken realms. And to have a sisterhood with 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 somebody that truly understands to the point where no words are needed, but the energetic contribution allows my whole nervous system to relax is pure, solid gold, baby. And so my favorite thing to do is to be able to bring individuals like yourself onto the podcast and extract the gold for others to be others to be able to actually integrate it into your everyday life and support you with living a little bit more of an empowered experience. Um, outside of my own personal connection with this fabulous star being that has graced planet Earth during a very pivotal time in the collective consciousness, she is a master breathwork facilitator she wouldn't use that word because she's very humble but i believe (laughs) her and her partner (laughs) lucas are traveling around the world and introducing to so many people to to the masses and highly impactful individuals the power of breath the power of intention the power of life as ceremony and recognizing that the gift has been uh, is been with us uh, hiding in plain sight the whole time which is our breath um and also she and her partner 
are leading online trainings and in-person trainings to support others, to be able to start guiding others in a good way through um, educating through trauma release and emotions that are stuck in the body and how to release them in a healthy way, in a safe way, and recognizing that the world needs more safe places to heal. And so what better way than to be the embodiment of what you believe that the world needs more of than stepping in and creating so many healing spaces around the planet. So this woman is revolutionary and has massively impacted my life for the better. I am a better human because Halloween exists. So welcome to the podcast, Hala. It's so good to be back. I'm, I'm so excited. Happy to have you, yeah. I guess that makes me a little VIP now. I'm getting familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always Although been. The space has had a bit of a glow up since I came last. And there's a few more plants. We were at the table. We've got the godly oh, right. embrace going on. I'm you never made it. it to the golden hands yet. No. Uh, I graduated. <laughs> welcome to the hands of the goddess. Thank you. It feels good. There's been some very sacred tushies on that chair. I'm absorbing all yeah, yeah. Of Absorb it and then also infuse In some, yeah, yeah, yeah. your sacred touche. I will. Onto the hands of the goddess. It's happening now. <laughs> In real time. You hear it here first, folks. Hello, Weston's touche is blessing these hands. <laughs> um, so we were kind of like milling about on different topics that we could dive into. And one thing that really stood out was how to navigate the world as what we call a HSP. And I'm not going to go too much into this. I would love for you to explain what a HSP is. Yeah, this sure. is a term that I even just recently learned from a dear brother of mine, Matt De uh, Daher. Daher? Okay, his last name. Um, and he told me about HSP and I actually read the book mm -hmm. on it. And then I was like, oh, oh, context really helps to understand how to navigate the world as a HSP. Um, and so I would love to hear from you, like, what is that and um to hear some of your wisdom that you've extracted from navigating spaces of high density even the fact that you live in los angeles mm. and you work with certain people that you work with yeah and the majority of your training is based on the fact that you have trained yourself to listen to the unspoken which means that you need to be sensitive how to navigate keeping your superpower online while also not draining yourself being in spaces. So go for it, Hal. I'm just laid on like 10 questions for you there. Okay. You've got a lot to chew on. Let's go. Okay, so starting at the beginning, an HSP <clears throat> is a highly sensitive person. And the way I look at it, we all are processing information in every moment of every day, whether we're awake or asleep. And a highly sensitive person is taking in and processing potentially more information in each given second and therefore feeling more, processing more, and it can be really overwhelming. So we know that a part of being a feeling living human being on this planet, right, is that we process information through the nervous system. So it's said that for HSPs, their central nervous system is literally processing more information in every second. And as a result, highly sensitive people who aren't aware that they are, you know, that they aren't that can experience being overwhelmed. They can go into long-term anxiety. They can feel like something's wrong with them. They might be continually called overly sensitive, hypersensitive. Like, why are you always so emotional? Why do you always react so strongly? They can be considered empaths, feeling the emotions and energy of other people. They might also be very sensitive to things like body language, subtle shifts in people's eye contact, little cues that people express unconsciously that for maybe an average person are invisible and go unnoticed. But for an HSP, that information is logged. It's taken in and it creates a, a reaction of some kind. And so I think of HSPs as being empowered and disempowered. You know, it depends on how aware we are of it and how many tools that we have developed over time to process our sensitivity, to process all of that information. So that's something I'm really passionate about as an HSP myself. I didn't know for a long time and I thought something was wrong with me. And I remember as a kid that I could always feel so much of what everyone else was going through around me and 
because it was all so internally deeply felt, there was a merging or a blending that took place where someone else's emotions and sensations started to feel like my emotions and sensations. And as a result, it also felt like it was my responsibility to do something with that. So when other people are suffering, I feel like I need to take action. I need to make them feel better. I need to help them to heal. I need to solve their problems for them in order for me to feel okay. And that's a big part of my work now is to help highly sensitive people to recognize that just because you can feel a lot doesn't mean that it's your responsibility to fix everyone, to solve other people's problems, to take on other people's pain, any more than authentically feels inspired to do so. HSPs have a gift. We're here to help, right? We are are deeply feeling for a reason. And I think that we're a part of a huge shift that's happening on the planet right now to go from being unconscious, selfish, service to self, to being interconnected as a society, to actually care enough to realize that we are all connected, we are all impacting each other, and it can become conscious. And as a result of that consciousness, right, going from being numb to taking that information in and recognizing that interconnectedness, we can shift how we relate to one another. But that requires a collaborative effort. It's not the role of the HSP to do all of the heavy lifting. And I think that's what a lot of highly sensitive people struggle with is being like, I'm feeling it all and they're the one that's going through it and I feel like it's up to me and then you get extremely burdened, right? So self-care is very important. Boundaries are very important. Uh, Discernment and recognizing also what's actually effective to support people because another thing that I experienced as an HSP is in our society, many of us are conditioned or raised right through childhood and through different feedback mechanisms from society that the way to solve a problem is to go into fixing right logic rational like let's practically do something to make this issue go away but actually a lot of the time the way through is to hold the space and to empathize without needing to fix anything to be a witness and to like really let someone know I feel you and I'm with you and this is a safe space and that's more of the feminine approach I guess you could call it like masculine and feminine energy both are necessary but I think a lot of HSPs who haven't explored this by default go into problem solving and it it becomes often codependent dynamics where they're continually playing that role of the rescuer and the fixer rather than being the awareness, the witness and the safe space of like compassion and love for people to do their own inner work. So for example, you are in a conversation with your beloved. Yep. And there is, whether you like it or not, a good amount of attachment to their well-being because this person is also sleeping in a bed with you every night and you're making love to them and like the energy is very like interconnected and interwoven Mm -hmm. and you're a highly sensitive individual and your partner is going through a process how would you navigate that in a way well dooly dooly um how would you navigate that in a way where essentially it is being the hollow bone, where it's allowing, and what I mean by the hollow bone is that you can feel almost on the inside of the emotion with your beloved, for example, but without it being filtered through a personal lens, like this is about me or what I'm feeling this person's sadness or unworthiness has because I did something or because I said something or and to genuinely hold space in the sense where it's like, I'm allowing my body to feel everything you're feeling without it being caught through the filter of thinking it's about me. Mm. Do you have any guidance around that? Yeah, so relatable. 
I'm sure. I'm, so that's why I asked because I feel like, like most help. people that are in partnership or even just so around someone they have a crush on or that right. there's an attachment to the way that that person shows exactly. up. Exactly. Even a friend, a sibling. Yeah, a exactly. There's like member. a there's a love there. There's a, there's like a connection. Yeah. How do we navigate that while not turning down our sensitivity or shutting it off ultimately? There are multiple things that I think are important. One is, of course, communication. Because if everything is kept in silence, then what are we expected to do? Become a mind reader, right? So speaking up, if you're sensing that something is off, that there's something going on, communicate and communicate from a place of curiosity rather than accusation. Because I think for myself, I can recall countless times where. I have felt that something wasn't right and my immediate entry into the conversation was, I feel like you're angry at me, why are you being mean, blah, 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 like as if something was wrong in the dynamic, I was assuming that and that was my starting point. So instead of coming from that place, I think it's important to gently learn to communicate with curiosity, like, hey, I'm sensing that there's something here. What are you feeling? I'm sensing that you're tense. I'm sensing that you're irritable. I'm just noticing that you're behaving this type of way. Can you let me know if there's anything that I can do to support you? And approaching it from a place of curiosity and service, but there's a line here, right? Service without taking it all on is a good place to start. The other thing is when someone says that it's not about you, it's actually then up to you. Like that's your side of the street to recognize that what someone says has to be simultaneously taken at face value. Like, okay, you said it's not about Mm me. Got it. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it there. And also recognize that sometimes people do say it's not about you and there's nothing going on. And there is, right? That's just the realities of being human. But if someone isn't ready to communicate that, then it's useless to press the issue on and on. At that point, usually I find that's a cue to take space, to give that person some breathing room to do their own thing. And that's, again, where you can offer, hey, okay, I'm hearing you and I'm here as well. If you want to talk about it, I'll give you space for now and we can chat later if you want to. Just let me know. And there, then it's up to you to get to work on your own internal experience. So there's different things that can help. I think an important one is grounding, getting out of your head. Because as a sensitive person, what we experience in our bodies is like raw energy and information. But it's what we do with that information. So for many of us, it then becomes thoughts. And then these thought forms develop into stories. And it's usually the stories that run wild that create further suffering. But if you can feel someone else's energy or sensations in your own body, there are practices that you can do instead of generating thoughts and making a drama, an imaginary drama in your mind, instead you can actually shift that energy through the body. And what I notice a lot with highly sensitive people is that they actually find it very difficult to be in the body because there is so much sensation and information there. There's a dissociation that occurs and they end up up here in the mental field overanalyzing or distracting, going into scrolling on their phone, watching YouTube, Um, distracting themselves with conversations, talking to other people, gossiping, creating arguments, conflicts, drama. But actually what they could do instead is turn to a practice like going for a walk, getting out in nature, doing a breathwork practice, doing a meditation. And instead of all of that energy and information coming up here and rising like a volcano, you can actually diffuse it down into the earth and surrender it, like hand it over. If you've done your part to be of service from a sincere place and another person isn't receptive, what is best to do with that energy is to diffuse it and let it go. Because anything more than that, it creates unnecessary tension 
and stress. And this is the other thing, right? We see a lot with highly sensitive people that they, they get digestive issues, tension in the body that builds up over time. So, so incredibly common to see highly sensitive people with things like IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, and other digestive issues. And that is all the stewing and lack of digestion of information, emotions, and energy. So it's really important, I think, for sensitive people to learn to let it go and not hold unnecessarily. And then the other piece of this, which is so important, is to recognize that other people suffering isn't necessarily a bad thing. So what is your relationship with pain? What is your relationship with hardship? with learning through difficulty. If we're attached to everything being love and light and rainbows all the time, then of course, when someone else is pissed off at us or being really grumpy and stomping around the house or going through a stressful situation, we're going to be like, this is so bad and I need to make it go away and this isn't how it should be. That's a story. That's a perception, right? And that is also an indicator that there is a resistance to learning and growth and uh, progress through friction. Like, I don't want to feel that and therefore I have to make it go away. Friction and challenges are awesome. They're a good thing. Hardship and pain, grief, suffering, anger, sacred rage, they're good things. So the more that I respect, like truly respect suffering, the less I'm concerned when someone is suffering because I trust the process. If I'm not trusting the process and that that suffering is going to lead to something good, then of course I'm going to get all grippy about it. So that's been huge as well. It's going, oh, great. There's some friction happening here. I get to be the witness to this and trust that they will grow stronger through this process. I'm here to support, but I'm not here to take that opportunity away because that's like coddling and that doesn't help people grow. I feel like <clears throat> whether we've identified with as a HSP, a highly sensitive person or not, um, these are really in, like, powerful life lessons navigational tools through just life in general and the the nature of the inhale and the exhale yeah um i believe that from my own personal experience i was born a highly sensitive person then i shut all of that down and wasn't a highly sensitive person for quite some time as very disconnected from a deeper level of listening to everything around me and then I became a highly sensitive person again through a journey of refinement. Mm. And I look at photos of myself when I was in my 20s, early 20s in college, and it was like the lights were on, but no one's home. Like I was being this version of myself that was living based from outside in, like telling me who I should be and where I should go to school and what I should study and what I should say and what's appropriate to wear and how I should present myself. and there's like a, a disconnect of vitality and also like a numbing around a deeper level of sensitivity because there wasn't a discernment between that that enriches and that that depletes. It kind of all just melted into the same sound. As I became discerning around who I hang around with, who do I follow online, what food am I eating? What environments am I in? What am I doing in between moments? What is my morning practice like? How is my prayer practice? You know, how much time am I spending in nature? Am I taking my shoes off and grounding in the earth? How am I utilizing my breath? All of these things that came back into my life started to actually train me to a very deep level of sensitivity. Again, the same sensitivity I had as a kid, but had to necessarily shut it down to be able to operate in the environment in which I was placed in. So do you believe that we are born high, uh, um, highly sensitive people 
or there's a difference between highly sensitive individuals and p- people that are not highly sensitive individuals? Do you believe that highly sensitive individuals can become highly sensitive individuals? Like, how do you see it working based off of, you know, is this like a genetic lottery that like I was born a <laughs> I got the I'm HSP, here and I feel everything. You know. And you're not highly sensitive, <laughs> and you're gonna go all the way through life and not be a HSP. So I'm curious around like, what do you believe starts the journey of a highly sensitive individual? Mm. I don't think there's one way it can happen. I see all the time nowadays that people can become highly sensitive, and. That is why I am so, so passionate about kind of combining the tools that I have. So for example, you know that we share breath work, right? And breath work is incredibly helpful for regulating the nervous system. And also a huge part of what we do is using the breath to help people go into a non-ordinary state of consciousness, which is basically allowing them to open up to all of the things that the conscious mind has shoved to the back. So in our daily lives, we're like focusing on what we're going to have for breakfast and lunch and who we're going to see and what's on our to-do list and all of these superficial things that require more logic than intuition. And when we go into a non-ordinary state of consciousness, the brain starts firing in different ways. We have more access to the right brain, to creativity, but also to the limbic brain, which is the emotional center. And that's what opens up like the floodgates of feeling. So through this process, what we've seen is that the more breath work people do, the more easily they can access their emotions. So for example, nowadays, I don't even need to do a breath work journey to have a breath work journey like experience. I can take myself there very easily and allow emotions to move through me to fully feel something and get it all the way to the point of letting go because my body knows how to do that now. It's like a remembering process. And now it's like, oh, okay, there we go. I'm feeling something's there. I need to allow my emotions to flow. And instead of swallowing it down and tightening my jaw to stop the tears from coming out and getting all like tense and trying to distract myself and focus on a thought that makes me not feel. Instead, I recognize the cues of emotions needing to be processed. I allow it to move and boom, the energy wave comes, it rises up, it takes as long as it takes. And then I'm back to my kind of baseline. So as people do breath work more, as I was saying, there's more ease there in feeling their emotions. There's also more empathy that gets developed. So for example, I've had clients who have said to me that they haven't cried in 15 to 20 years. Not one, I've had multiple of these all around the world, clients who have 10, 20, even 30 years, not a single tear, trying to get an emotion out, unable to, their body is so locked up and all of those emotions are so buried deep within the subconscious. So in the breathwork sessions, they access these emotions and those floodgates start to open and it feels incredible. It's like the most freeing, beautiful thing because with the pain also comes love, right? The emotions are like two sides of the same coin. So more self-love comes in, more relief and more relaxation. And if you think about a body that's soft and loose, it's more easily moved. And so in that softness comes, oh, yeah, okay, there's an emotional wave. I've got to allow that to flow out. But it also means it's almost like a more permeable cell membrane, if you like. So if you imagine someone who's rock hard, armored up, guarded, they're, they're closed off to not only their own feelings, but everyone else's feelings. They're in that mindset of, I don't give a anymore. Like I'm numb, I don't care. And there are a lot of people living like that right now. And so as that armor, that hardening begins to break down and the person realizes from the inside out that it's actually a lie, that deep down underneath, they do care. There is pain there. There is love there. 
And as that, that armoring cracks more and more and more, what comes out the other side is like a different operating system. It's like a computer that gets an upgrade of new software. And suddenly there's kind of new rules to the game where they're like, wait, I used to go out or hang out with my friends or I was in a relationship and I didn't care how they felt. I, I just did me. Like whatever I want to do, I did that. And none of their emotions or moods or vibes affected me. And all of a sudden now I've, you know, I've been doing this breath work. It's starting to affect me. How do I deal with that? And at that point, I'm like, amazing. So they're becoming more sensitive. But there's new, there's like a new kind of uh, rule book that's required or new guidelines. And I feel like that's where I really come in to help guide people in how to navigate life as a deeply feeling person. Because that's been my norm. And I was told that I was a weirdo, right? I was told that I wasn't normal. I'm like, what's wrong with me? (laughs) And now I'm like, okay, this could be the new normal. And we could make it safe. Instead of making each other wrong for feeling and caring, safety and guidelines and how to channel it as a gift allows us to be in our power around it. So that was my long-winded way of saying, yes, you can become an HSP (laughs) and it's awesome, but you do need to understand that life will be different. So it's like approach with caution. Recognize that if you want to do deep, deep inner work that breaks down all of those armor layers, you will feel more deeply. And that is kind of like being a a tree that can be a little more movable with the wind. You're not so uh, fixed in the ground anymore. But that's a gift. Mm -hmm. It's just a different life experience to have. And with that also comes increased intuition creativity, being a, like a hollow bone, right? Being able to connect into divine inspiration. And that's how I live my life now is by tuning in, by allowing my sensitivity to guide me. And these days I feel like I, I relate to my humanness in such a humble way where I'm more in awe of my spirit. Like my humanness is great. It's fine. It's good. It's nice to be human. It's nice to have a mind. It's nice to be able to learn things and have human conversations and have a human personality. But I'm more inspired by my spirit. And it's my sensitivity that allows me to connect into that. And actually, that's where some of my greatest learning comes from. I've been able to have the privilege of being able to witness people witness you. And say things to me about you that you would never hear. And the majority of of what I have or hear people say about you is how powerful your silence is. Mm. Maybe not those exact words, but it's like, oh, I, I've never even got to have a drop in with her, but I can feel how powerful she is. Like I'm so curious about that whole universe that is hell up because she's not saying anything, but there is so much going on there. And I do really feel like the more you have given yourself permission to access, the richer you have become, there's less to prove. And yet it's still impactful. Your, Your presence is still being felt. I'm curious. Because I've seen you and I've connected with you in many very dense environments. Um, and what I mean by dense environment is super loud, flashing LED lights, um, people that are actually not connecting at all. Everyone's on their cell phones or, you know, these kind of, what I mean by dense is that there's like a lot of information. Right now, we're sitting in the podcast space. There's a couple of people here in this space. It's not that much information to process, right? Like we're having a conversation and it's quiet. And so, yeah, there's a lot less information to process. And the spaces that you and I keep weaving in and being like, oh, (laughs) we're back here. How are you doing? Like a little nudge. Like, yeah, we're good. (laughs) You know, and there's been moments where we pulled each other aside and we're like, I'm going down. (laughs) The waters are closing over my head. Throw out a line. You know, I'm like, "Ah." Um, I'm curious as uh, my purpose in the Gene Keys is is empathy. And Mm. and 
to go into the word empathy from my perspective is not be like, oh, I feel you. Like, I, I feel your sadness or I feel your happiness. It's, I feel your emotion inside of my body and I am processing it with you, with the tools that I have cultivated in this life to, to actually be able to help excavate. That's, that's not, not serving. Now, to be in that level of empathy as a highly sensitive individual in a dense environment what are your preparations when you know you're about to enter into a space like that mm. without shutting down your superpower of your ability to read all that's not spoken? Okay. So this is a really good segue from what we were speaking about around the new software upgrade and this experience that we can have as sensitive beings. because. The things that I used to be able to do when I was more shut down in my own sensitivities as well, because I went through a stage like that, as you described, that it requires me to conserve my energy more. So that's a huge thing. I can't just go, 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 go. I realize my own limitations and I've come to accept them. And so for me, that requires like shutting the curtains closing out space in my calendar, not being available, knowing that I don't have to reply to every DM that I'm getting or every email. And I actually am allowed to take space to energetically prepare by filling up my own cup. So I am a pro at resting and relaxation. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love my alone time. I thrive in quiet. And so I spend a lot of time alone and you know, the memes that are like, what are you, what are you doing tonight? We want to come to the party. I can't, I'm busy. Can't, I'm busy. Here with like, face mask on. I'm like, I can't, I'm busy. That's me. That is so me. And if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't be entering into a space where I'm required to serve with clean energy, clean, clear energy, energetic hygiene is extremely important to me. It's a part of the mastery of the work that I do is to pay attention to not only the unseen in everyone else, but also to acknowledge that unseen within myself and to ensure that it is clear, it's high integrity, it's pristine, so that when I enter into that space, I'm actually able to contribute something of value or remove something that's not of value without bringing in my own burdens, you know? So Rest is important. Obviously, energetic hygiene practices. I meditate every day. I journal. I do my awakened breath work. Those are like the non-negotiables that allow me to enter into a space and feel like I am who I say I am. Anything less than that and no, I need to go and like check myself. And so that's what we also teach anyone who trains with us as a breathwork facilitator and people who I mentor is energetic hygiene matters. It's not a time to get sloppy. When you're about to go into serving in the subtle realms, you need to take that seriously. And I've witnessed it in myself. And so I know that other people go through it where you can be in a dense environment and doing your energy work or being like an emotional support for someone. It doesn't even have to be energy work. But you leave that space and you know that it was a lot. But you leave that space, you're tired, you want to switch off, you want to relax. And so maybe that day, instead of sitting down to actually feel these sensations and energy and allow it to diffuse downward right into the earth to dissolve, to be felt, processed and released, instead you go into like, oh, I'm just going to distract myself and watch Netflix to unwind and like order Uber Eats to go and just chill and, and decompress after that dense. Guilty. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Me too, I've done it. <laughs> and yeah, it can feel temporarily, uh, right? That's what we're seeking is that, uh, that ability to let go. But if we're letting go by distracting, what we're doing is kind of shoving it under the rug and keeping all of that energy there. And so what I notice for me is it will come out through dream time. I'll be 
thinking about other people, like my clients, people that I was with in these environments and trying to solve their problems in my freaking sleep. And I don't want to do that. (laughs) So instead, what I try to do is be very present when I'm in spaces, recognize when I am going into the old pattern, because I do it as well, the old pattern of how do I fix this person's problem or make their pain go away. So while I'm in this space, I'm continually reminding myself that everyone is guided. Everyone is capable of evolution, growth, learning. It's not up to me to save anybody. So I'm there as a loving witness and I represent possibility. And if people are open to having an inspiring conversation or experiencing a shift in their energy in some trippy cosmic way while I happen to be there, awesome. But anything more than that, I I leave. It's not mine to carry. The more unnecessary responsibility I take on in any space, the worse I feel. And another part of this is too that the awakening, if we want to call it that, this shift in consciousness, it's going to take time. And so I don't need to go into a space where everyone is unaware, let's say, like operating at a very 3D level and think that it's my role to transform their perception overnight. Relax. Long-term game. People are only capable of taking in what they're capable of taking in. And if we bombard people with energy and information, it's like wasteful. It's like throwing too much food at someone, it ends up in the trash. Such a waste of energy. And so I really try to listen and feel like with that empathy for how much people are actually ready for and let that be enough and really trust the process. And also like lead, lead by example. I mean, there's, there's so many things to this, but pushing our way on other people in these environments is really off-putting. So the more we can like go in, relax, notice where we're making things wrong, judging, putting things in boxes, diffuse all of those binary ways of processing information within ourselves, practice presence coming from a place of love and openness, notice if there's tensions or things starting to accumulate within us and aim as much as possible to diffuse it in the moment. And then when you leave, notice that desire to get away from sensations or thoughts or emotions or uh, notice the desire to cope with a feeling of tiredness or emotional overwhelm, let's say, in unhealthy ways, and then choose better, do better. And then you're not going to get it right every time. Just like, I don't, you don't. We're like, okay, (laughs) I ate a burger and I don't feel so good. (laughs) And then just learn little by little and do better and better and better. And that's how you're able to maintain more of that like baseline clarity. It's really helpful to just have some context around specifically somebody that presents himself in a way of like power in public spaces, power through your videos, power through the people that you're connecting, power through the clients that are being magnetized towards you. And also recognizing that we must bring the human into this conversation of There are times when I don't have it figured out or I didn't zip up my energetic force field before I went in or my energetic hygiene was off. And then actually the places in which one learns of how Mm. to really become the embodiment of the tools in which you're speaking of. And it's through trial and error and it's through recognizing what works and what doesn't. And I think that in society today, we are highly, highly, highly distracted more than I think we've ever been 
based off of our cell phones and the amount of energetic and physical tabs that can be open at once. And like I'm storing my cacao while also scrolling on the gram and responding to my emails and chatting with so-and-so. And like there's so much going on that the att- attention span has become super short. And then it's so easy without even a thought to go, oh, I feel uncomfortable. Oh, I'll just watch, watch Netflix. Without even the context of understanding like if I want to be of service and yet maintain my sensitivity, I must put as a non-negotiable and a priority to clean my energetic hygiene before I then enter into somebody else's field in a place of service. But also recognizing that just to be human in itself is already extremely overwhelming (laughs) or upwhelming. And even just navigating interpersonal relationships, the importance of energetic hygiene, because we are consciously or unconsciously always absorbing our environment. Mm -hmm. And for example, the other day, um, I co-facilitated a breathwork experience alongside you and Lucas and Aubrey and Vi and Jaggers and Anahata and like the whole crew. And like, and it was Jedi. epic. <laughs> it was amazing. It was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And simultaneously, I mean, I was like really deep healing. You'd be amazed. At the energy that moves through people when they just intentionally breathe in a ceremonial space. It is absolutely remarkable. I've seen of equal measure, people move through stuff just from their breath, just from their breath, as they have in the middle of the Amazon jungle on night three of an ayahuasca ceremony. Mm -hmm. It is of equal measure, of equal impact of like the places that people can go. And it's so mind blowing, like so easy to underestimate like the power of breath. Um, but I went into that experience already with like what I'd like to call the scorpionic death portal that I just made it out through. And I was literally like, it was day one of the first day in like a couple of months where I actually finally am taking a breath of air above the waves. And I'm like, (gasps) and then I was like, ah, now bite into service. And a part of my going through the death portal is that if my body needs to sleep for 14 hours, then I'm going to sleep for 14 hours. And I'm just going to keep listening. But that also meant that my energetic hygiene was not as on point as it usually is. And then I feel like, okay, put me in coach. I'm ready to serve. I've been out of the game for two months, you know? And then I go in and I'm holding space for these, these, exper- these people that are processing as a highly sensitive person. I'm literally placing my hand on their heart and I get a vision from them when they were a kid of the memory that they're, they're pulling up. And I go into that experience with them. And then I start being like, oh my God, I'm crying with them. Like I'm literally moving the energy through them, through me with them as they cry. I'm crying and I'm like fully in it. And I'm like, where do I end? And where do you begin at this point? Like I, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling everything you're feeling. Yeah. And then just hop 30 centimeters over to the right onto the next person that's going through the whole world of what they're unraveling and their memory and then they're raging and I'm raging with them. And within a 30 second time frame, I've gone from deep sadness and despair and grief to pure rage. And that is only a 30 second slot into a seven hour back to back breathwork experience coming from two months of going through a death portal with about this much to give and my energetic hygiene practice being pretty low. What happens right after the breathwork is that I get sick. And I mean like sick, sick. I'm like a temperature of 103 and I could hardly open my eyes, let alone like get out of bed, you know? Um, and I feel like, you know, I've been playing in this realm for quite some time. And a lot of my training has come from helping people move through unspoken or um, denser energies that sit in the body. And yet simultaneously, I still went down. And I feel like a lot of my lessons have come from the shadow nature of it, of being a highly sensitive person. Um, what would you what do you feel like the times when you are out and you don't want a human anymore and you've taken on more than you can take on and you've closed the blinds and you are in your cocoon? What do you feel like is the greatest lessons or teaching slash curriculum that you've extracted from the times when you can't human anymore? Oh <laughs> That's relatable. a loaded question. That's a loaded <laughs> it's question. Good. It's good. <laughs> Okay, so the biggest thing that comes up for me right now is 
getting really, really honest about why you keep leaning in and saying yes when your body is saying no? It's a pretty deep question. How far back we want to go with that inquiry is up to each of us. It's a very personal thing. I can say for myself that the wounded healer thing is so real. And while I absolutely am inspired by and committed to contributing to the raising of consciousness, there's also a part of me that came into this work that I do now because of trauma and pain from childhood that I was trying to uh, make sense of and heal. And so there's bleed through that happens in our motivations for doing certain things and also our roles that we believe each of us are here to play on this planet. So for example, for me, as from a very young age, I identified as like, I'm the helper. I'm the good girl. I'm always here for other people. I'm kind. And these are lovely qualities, but they can become like a prison if you feel like you can't not be that. So what would it look like to not be kind? Can you go there? <sighs> dun, dun. <laughs> I have a really hard time with that one. <laughs> I'm the good girl. Right? What about people thinking that you're a bitch? I mean, depends what kind of bitch. Like, yeah, bad like bitch. a bad like, bitch. I'm a bad bitch. <laughs> I'm down for that. Or <laughs> thinking that you're selfish, unavailable, mm. too cool, snobby, blah, blah, blah. Like the list goes on. Not helpful. That, some, that you're actually in a process. Like all of these different um, ways of presenting can become prisons for us. Right. If we're not movable out of them to embrace our mm. humanity. So I think that's a really important part to look at. And then another one is also financial gain, for example, or appearing to have it together. And I've seen this in my own life as well, where if you have a career as a people helper, you have clients that are booked in, right? You have a schedule that you have to maintain. And so it gets a little complex to navigate if you've got a client booked in on Wednesday at midday and on Wednesday you wake up and you feel like crap. Mm. What do you do? You're like, I want to be, I want to be reliable. I want to be there for my client. And at the same time, I really don't feel like my energy is clean mm -hmm. and in a good place to serve. I don't have the perfect answer. All I can say is what I do. And for me personally, I'm, I'm honest and I prioritize the hygiene and the purity of the work. So if I'm not on, I'm just going to let my client know, Hey, woken up today, I'm feeling really off. I'm not sure what's up. I need some time and space to process this. I want to make sure that I'm serving you at the highest level possible. You know, I treat this work as sacred. Can we please reschedule? Sure. Like most people don't have a problem with it. And the, the people that I've mentored over the years who are like, I couldn't do that. I can't bail on my client. Okay. You're going to show up like dirty energetically. Is that serving them or are you just trying to do what they can see and, and like they won't know? No, that's fucking dishonest. People are energetically aware, maybe not in their, their mind consciously, but they're energetically processing and perceiving everything. And it, to me, it's not of service to go into a space if we're feeling really messy and, and uh, our body is telling us no. Now. There is a, a caveat here, if you like. Sometimes when I am feeling beaten down by life, I'm actually my strongest in service. This is so personal to each individual. You have to, you have to know yourself and have a spiritual practice that allows you to connect in to that true, wise inner voice that will tell you, I know you don't want to do this. I know you're tired. I know you feel raw and broken and like you've got nothing to give. That's what the people need. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I can recall some of my best work 
whether it's speaking or one-on-one work with people, facilitating energy work, coaching comes from when I'm in the thick of really, really hard shit. And the way that I speak is so targeted and the way that I can connect and understand the pain that they're going through is like, I'm like a laser beam because I'm in it. <laughs> if we don't go through hard times, how can we relate and connect? And I think of, you know, our brains, we've got neural pathways, we're, we're mapping reality constantly. All of this information that's coming in, we have to organize it and, and map it out in order to usefully navigate this reality. Well, if you understand pain, you're more skillfully able to navigate and work with other people's pain. So sometimes it can work to a real advantage. And that's where uh, you, you become the hollow bone as well. Like get out of the way. And sometimes too, there are, there are situations, like for example, us with that breathwork event, you can't just wake up and be like, yep, Sorry, guys, not today. Yeah. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> you could all just reschedule 200 of you and also what time facility is. If you didn't mind just rescheduling because I feel a little shit today. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <sighs> and so at that point, you've got to get realistic. Okay, life has called me to serve today. I'm feeling in my shit. I'm in the, I'm in the thick of it. We're swimming. And so what are you going to do? you got to get up. You got to call in your allies. You got to do a strong spiritual practice and ask for help. Like call on your homies, your friends, people who like say, for example, with you and me, you know, we have that relationship where if you're going through a hard time and we're about to go and serve, you can come to me and let me know. And I'm going to help you out behind the scenes. And like, we've got each other. And then afterwards, you know, maybe your body gets sick and is like, time out, like I'm done. So what would have happened if your body didn't tell you that? You probably would have stayed, kept on going, kept serving. Like there would be other people facilitating events, workshops and so on that you might have got called into like, oh, hey, Blue, want to help with this or want to come and sit in on this thing. So your body is like, okay, you served. Now we're shutting down shop. So you got to do it. And then body's like, now's the time. Let's, let's shut it down. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, self-care. I really resonate and agree with you in the sense of a lot of my most powerful talks, facilitation has come from, I've just received a text message that's completely shattered my heart and I receive it five minutes before I'm about to facilitate a circle for 30 women that are all sitting in their seat waiting for me to come out of the bathroom. This has happened. (laughs) And I'm like, my heart's like shattered yeah and I'm like everyone's in place and waiting for me to open the circle and I go upstairs and sit down in my seat and I'm so close and connected to my emotions to empathy to compassion for anyone that's going through whatever and it's like when I go into prayer to open up the space it's so much more raw and so much more vulnerable and so much more authentic that actually the heartbreak is the, is, I think it's Rumi that says the cracks is where the light enters. Like when you come from this cracked place, this is actually where the gift is, is available. And um, I find that our greatest challenge in life, just in general, this is the ethos of, of the Gene Keys, our greatest challenge is also simultaneously our greatest gift. So for example, to go through heartbreak, and to feel it to the point where it's brought you down to your knees. And another Rumi quote is like, when life brings you to your knees, it puts you in a great position to pray. Like, to be brought to that space of despair, and then fast forward a month, and you have a sister in front of you that's going through heartbreak, the level of compassion, empathy, understanding, tools to support with the experience, because the only time that I can actually receive somebody else's wisdom is when it's embodied yeah and the only way to embody wisdom is to have gone through whatever initiation that has instilled that wisdom into the experience and so 
there's so many spiritual guides and mentors and and people that are sharing content online and motivational videos. But there's something in, and a highly sensitive person will for sure pick up on this, that it's not about the words, it's the vibration of the words and the vibration is determined on their level of embodiment or not. Mm-hmm. So when you enter a space and people are going, wow, Hella's energy is like really powerful. I can feel it. I can't wait to drop in with her. That is, a, from my perspective, a contribution of the fact that you do not miss a meditation in the morning or you incorporate breath work to the point where you can access a different part of your brain, which allows to shut the ego off for a second, all of a sudden comes back to your center and you marinate in that for 30 minutes. That is the very contribution to you entering a space and not needing to quote unquote peacock being, oh, and I'm this and I've done this and I've achieved that and I'm living here and I've da 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 and I have this many followers. And it's like, it's like living from the outside in that goes, my sense of worth is placed in something I've achieved, but actually recognizing that you're inherently worthy based off of how much you've given yourself permission to access within your own consciousness. Mm-hmm. And that actually is not determined by a single syllable that you say. And you can sit at a dining room table and everybody's talking over everybody to get a sense of importance in the space, but recognizing actually my importance and my worth comes from how much can I give myself permission to let whatever is alive breathe. And it's something that I feel like you embody so beautifully. And I find myself like the other day when we were sitting around the fire at Fit for Service and you guys had just arrived and there was a whole crew there. You didn't say much, but I was so curious what was going on in your head. I was like tracking you so hard because you have an ability to read the space from the frequencies that are unspoken. And so I'm always so curious towards the the richness of your silence. And to me, that is an embodied individual. What has your journey been like to recognize that you are worthy inherently in your silence in a public space where individuals are what we quote unquote peacocking, mm. presenting themselves to be worthy based off of their achievements, their, how they look, what they're wearing, how many followers, et cetera, et cetera, which is the noise of the world. And to actually recognize as somebody that doesn't need to speak all the time, what has been your relationship? with your worth in your silence in a public space? Mm. It has been honestly very challenging and I'm getting much better at it and I really appreciate the reflection. It's, it's such a confirmation that I'm doing, I'm doing the good things, you know, and it's, it's working. So for me, a big insight that I had was around my design as a in human sorry my human design so I am a projector and understanding the fact that I'm a projector helped me to understand that I can't make people see me and I can't push my energy on to others and be received the way I want to be and that was very difficult to get but ultimately it is empowering. It's again like a different guidebook or a set of rules for the game to understand that um, some people can get away with peacocking and it's likable. You know, there's certain personalities that they take up a lot of space. They're very loud. They are the center of attention and it's charismatic. It's intriguing. It's funny. It's light. They're like the life of the party. It's really great. It works for them. And then there are other people who try to do the peacocking thing and it's like, ah, weird. Doesn't feel quite right. And that's because we're processing every individual, not just based on what they say or their body language, but their energy. And so every aura and energy field is relating to everyone else's in a unique way. We've got a unique signature. Now, I'm not just saying that this is purely for projectors, but I do think it is somewhat important to to bear in mind that some people can pull off peacocking. For example, my partner Lucas, he can be more of the center of attention. And 
People love that. And I can take up space. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm very, very happy when I'm invited into a space where I feel that there's an, a really authentic flow going on. I can talk. I can go off. And I have, a lot, I have a lot to share. <laughs> but <clears throat> I've had to surrender the push. And I'm leaning more into a feminine way, if you like, of softening the need to try and prove externally and recognize that actually my energy speaks louder than words. But I also in this process have to forgive people for not recognizing my energy. And that has been the, the greatest like tension point or struggle is if I focus only on the physical, what people can see, what people can hear, um, the loudness, the, the boldness, then I'm playing a game that I shouldn't be playing. It's not true to my spirit. But if I'm focused on energetic authenticity, I'm operating literally, you could say, in a different dimension with the same people, but I'm no longer trying to prove myself in the 3D. I'm relating in a different dimensional space. And therefore, if people aren't there in that level of attunement to my energy, why would they see me? Why would they recognize my value? They're just not going to. If I take that personally, I suffer. If I can be grounded in the reality that not everyone is interested or open, to what I'm about, then I feel peace. Like, oh, okay, they're not aware of me. And therefore that's not an assignment that's God given, that God has given me. So I trust that I'm working in a co-creative dance at all times. And I trust that I will not shrink, right? We can't just hide and like sit in our rooms like hermits and expect people to recognize us or, or value us. That's a line that I draw, I'm like, must leave the house in order to be recognized. But I don't need to force or push. And what's for me will come to me and find me. And what's not won't. There's abundance. I don't need to try to be someone I'm not. I would rather attract people who are a, a real, like, fuck yeah match for my true self. What is meant for me, what is meant for me, there's nothing I can do to fuck it up. Exactly. What is not meant for me, there's nothing I can do to make happen. Mm -hmm. That mantra thing that Reverend Brown Elaine said to me once has stuck with me throughout my life. Anytime I start feeling my energy going up, up and out and wanting to validate my presence, my experience in this space, it's about coming back to that mantra of like, the magnetism of embodiment will always make sure that what is meant for me will never miss me. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I really got confronted with this piece, and it's super interesting to hear your perspective on it, when I could no longer hear group conversation. Like sitting at a big dining room table and everyone's quick where I'm super like witty and quick with my like responses and that's something that I that's like a gift of mine that I absolutely adore mm -hmm. and with my hearing I stopped being able to hear the conversations and the quick wit that was being thrown left right and then now this person da, 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 and all of a sudden what it was forcing me into was becoming the observer when I would be the life of the party and I would be the one that's jumping back and forth with the comedic experience in the space mm. and to actually start watching in a space of really big personalities, a degree of peacocking and a degree of just really just contributing to the energetics of what's most alive yep. and to sit in the silence, not only as an observer, but an, as an observer that can't hear what's going on. So there would be like, a wave of laughter and everyone's like, ha ah, laughing at something someone said. And I've got a straight face because I can't, I didn't hear the punchline. I didn't hear the joke. So I don't know what's going on. And actually the laughter is triggering to me because it's an indicator that I no longer on the same page as everybody. Mm -hmm. So what I was forced into was the question, 
am I worthy inherently just by being? If I can't hear what's going on and I'm for sure not contributing to the conversation, is my seat at the table as worthy as the person that's speaking the most? And the answer at the time was no. Like I'm not worthy to be here. And what the invitation was is recognizing that 93% of all communication is nonverbal. And because we're so reliant on our five senses that we don't train the extrasensory perception of a sixth sense to read all of the cues that are happening outside of the words that are being spoken and that actually words lie all of the time. Energy, it does not. You know as soon as you meet someone energetically whether they are on a primary person on your timeline. What I mean by that is that they're going to play a significant role. They're not an extra in your movie. They are a main role in your movie and you'll instantly be able to feel it based off of the extrasensory perception of intuition. Mm -hmm. And the way that intuition is strengthened is in moments where no longer am I actually reading everything that you're saying based off of the words that you're saying, but I'm actually reading your energy, your subtle cues, your eye contact, the direction of your feet, what you're doing with your hands, the pitch and the frequency of the voice when you talk about certain things. Are your eyebrows raising up and down? How is the pupil? Is it dilated? You know, they all of these are cues, but you do not actually have, I have not actually had the training of those cues because I became reliant on my five senses until one of my senses were deprived. Then all of a sudden I'm catapulted into a choice point that goes, do I shut down and think that I'm inherently unworthy because I have a physical ailment or do I receive the gift that is actually being presented where I am in the dojo and the training of the subtle senses, which is exactly where my service is born. So going back to the point of like our greatest challenge can also be our greatest gift. If the story I choose to place on it is that of an empowering nature. That's everything right there. And a point that you just brought up around your familiar way of processing information and relating to people kind of getting taken away from you and then you having to adapt is exactly what every single human being who desires to become more intuitive more aware more sensitive is going to have to go through in their own unique way and it can sound so abstract and like elusive, like, oh, okay, you're going to develop your intuitive abilities and how do you become an HSP? Or people ask me, how do you start to channel and all of these things? It's actually quite straightforward. It's being able to identify the information that is right there in front of you that you usually tune out. And that <laughs> is how patterns begin to be identified. So for example, for you, if you've been relying for X amount of years on being able to hear, then you haven't had to connect dots to be able to take in information in other ways. I know for myself and for a lot of people who develop high levels of sensitivity, it comes through trauma. It's a survival adaptation where if we aren't paying attention to those subtle cues that you were describing, something really bad could happen. And so we do it in order to keep ourselves safe or to keep the people that we love safe. And there's a lot of different ways that it can happen, but it, yeah. it can be a gift. Yeah. I had a really good friend of mine who was a 98-year-old Holocaust survivor, Amir's grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she would be able to sit in front of somebody and read. She was like, oh, you play the violin. And he was like, how do you know that? And she could tell by the way that his hands had formed and the calluses and, 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 and it, like she would be able to read Wow. These things in people. And I remember asking her, when, how did you get to this point where you knew how to read, know how to read people so well? And she said, my life depended on it. Because in the Holocaust, I had to know who I could trust and who I couldn't trust, who was pretending to be on my team and who was actually the enemy. She said, I had to change my name. I had to change the language that I spoke to survive the Holocaust. Wow. And so her whole way of surviving and she actually wrote a book called from miracle to miracle because she survived the holocaust when her whole family died her brother and both her parents died in the holocaust she was the only one that survived it and she said from miracle to miracle because she had trained based off a of survival mode how to read people that supported her actually living wow 
So it's to kind of like reinforce the point. Safety <laughs> perk in life. <laughs> if shit hits the fan. Rely on your intuition. Yeah. And those subtle cues. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody, maybe I'd like to think in my heart of hearts that everybody has good intentions um, for the most part. The execution and the impact can be distorted, mm -hmm. um, but nobody really like, I say maybe nobody because it's a pretty blanket statement, but I like to, when I meet people, believe that they have pure intentions and when things come out distorted or as angry or as a projection or as mean, it's because it's being filtered through a trauma lens mm -hmm. as opposed to, I just want to hurt you. Yeah. Um, it's actually very rare that I've come across anyone that just like wants to hurt someone just for the sake of hurting them, but more so it being filtered through a trauma lens um, or mm -hmm. a pain body. Yeah, and that's the thing. What's coming to my mind right now is People do have good intentions, but their intentions don't always include you. Like they can have good intentions for themselves. They could have good intentions for their bank account. Everyone has reasons for doing what they do, but it's super naive to think that people have good intentions for you mm -hmm. and your well-being yeah. or me and my well-being. Because yeah. and that's a part of that pattern identification ability, right? Some people aren't connecting the dots that way. They're like you've got nothing to do with what I'm thinking about. Like I want to achieve this agenda. I want to do this and that's good for me or that's good for this person or that's good for the economy or that's good for this war or whatever it may be. It goes across every level. We can find a good intention, but it doesn't include everybody necessarily. And I think that's like that balance, not being in the naive, like, oh, the, they're doing like, they've got a good intention there and I should forgive them. But to be grounded in the reality that people have motivations for doing things and if we can understand them and understand what's driving certain behaviors, then we can experience less internal suffering that is a result of the confusion. I think a lot of suffering when people do shitty things is not understanding why. It's like an open loop. A lot of people who experience trauma or abuse, it's like it haunts them. They're like, why did they do that? Well, they did it because they have an agenda that doesn't include your well-being. It's, it's that simple. And that, that is a whole other conversation. But I think it's important to recognize that um, people are operating in, operating in different planes of information, energy, emotion, physicality, different agendas that they're wanting to drive forward in life. And we've got to choose our lane and, and own it and do it well. And so that's why with the, the highly sensitive piece to come back to that, I just choose to operate in my lane and trust that this is my God-given role. Other people have theirs. I'm not here to convert and make people like, like me as in similar to me. I'm here to do this role really well. You're here to do your role really well. You've got your superpowers. I've got mine. Every single person has their superpowers. And there's ways for us all to like co-weave together and learn from one another. But the more that we try to um, convert other people to see what we see and do what we do, the more that we all suffer. I feel like so many people are going to be able to relate and extract gold from this this conversation and be able to inter, integrate it into our everyday lives and recognize that actually what would it look like if we can give ourselves the privilege of our process and um, not judge when the denser emotions present themselves, whether it's sadness, grief, shame, unworthiness, guilt, um, and we actually give ourselves full permission to feel it in its entirety. And then when we feel clear, recognizing that that's the very thing where our superpower is also born from right in the seed of the challenge. Um, and uh, it's so beautiful to be able to extract the gold from one highly sensitive person to another. And in these conversations, it also breathes the feeling that we're not so alone in the things that happen behind the scenes. And I think we are the first generation that has ever had Instagram stories. And so we are learning how that affects our consciousness based off of 
it's literally a story first and foremost and it's a highlight reel so not only is it a layer of a story but it's also a highlight reel with a filter on top of it so what it's doing is it's fragmenting or distorting our experience and then adding unworthiness shame guilt or suppression over the denser emotions that you will never really see on someone's highlight reel you don't see someone laying on the floor going through a double heartbreak and just like 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 gripping to the ground you know like we don't see those moments but it's in these conversations that is opening the door to a deeper level of compassion for the wars that we have within our own minds around how we relate to the shadow nature and how we can hold certain tools that help us navigate it but also recognizing that it's the very thing that connects us to the suffering of humanity ups our empathy deepens our compassion and allows our service to be way more potent Mm. Yes. And remember, there's so many human beings all over the world that we make assumptions about Mm -hmm. that are going through, like you said, difficult times. There's also a lot of people who are sensitive, who we don't know Mm -hmm. are as sensitive as they are. Like it's easy to actually put on a brave face and act like you're happy and post some stories or take some really nice photos and behind the scenes be suffering and or going through a lot of overwhelm. Being a sensitive person can come with all kinds of ups and downs, highs and lows, challenges and blessings. And all of those projections need to be questioned. Like what we see online is only a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction of who people are. And I think that's even an important awareness to bring into group spaces. You know, you touched on the group, the dense environments that we might go into, groups that we're finding ourselves in these days and I just want to like I know we're coming to the completion and say that that's also an assumption that I carry into those spaces is that there are sensitive people that are putting on brave faces Mm -hmm. and my authenticity will allow them to meet me there Mm -hmm. and if I'm just assuming that everyone's superficial and doesn't want deep connection it doesn't make it possible so by being me and not making superficial assumptions about other people whether it's online or in person I create more space for people's goodness their gifts their magic to come out and for us to relate in that space and it's something that I encourage everyone to remember like drop the assumptions everyone feels everyone goes through shit everyone wants to feel safe and accepted and seen as they actually are, whether you consider yourself an HSP or an empath or not. And I think from there, life just becomes more meaningful, Mm -hmm. more deep, more interesting, more juicy, more rich. Mm -hmm. And the humanity and the unity is reborn in those spaces. And it's kind of like an emphasis on what we mean when we say you are the medicine. When people have a safe space, and what I mean by safe space is a non-judgmental space, to be whatever it is alive for them, that is the space in which people can heal in. And so that is the general theme. Everybody on this planet, whether they have a very interesting way of say, showing it or not, just wants to be seen, respected, acknowledged, heard, and loved. And we have very interesting ways of responding to that, whether it's through a pain body and it can become out as a projection, but ultimately the only thing that will melt Whatever it is that's not serving is love. That's the only thing. And I think that you have been placed in the field of high impact individuals because you are meeting their human with complete love. And in that presence, even if you're not saying anything, it's just the energy contribution people will start to unravel and be able to access deeper levels of their empathy and their feeling in your presence. And that is, I truly think what it means to be of service. It's not, I'm showing up and it's nine o'clock now AM and I'm clocking in for my service, but it's actually about who do I be from the person that's opening the door at the hotel entrance to the person that's serving me food, to my beloved, to my best friends, to the complete stranger on the side of the road. Is there a consistency of recognizing that my service is never switched off because I am committed to loving people and committed to loving myself. Can't 
stand it when I see people who are acting all holy and woke and then you see behind the scenes that it's really a means of gaining status and influence. Like be consistent. Be, like you said, kind, loving, respectful. Meet people with eye contact. Every single person is navigating so much that we can't even imagine. And I've heard you talk about it so many times. Like go to the grocery store. Give, give that person that you meet at the checkout a little energy. You have no idea of the ripples of that. And that's like you said, service. It's a 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year way of being, not a job. It's a way of being. Living life is a prayer, not a performance. Hmm. <laughs> Well, this conversation, I feel like there's, there's, I, I, I'm definitely going to revisit it and bring my notepad and start taking some notes and, and recognizing that the difference between knowledge and wisdom is integration and embodiment. And so like, there's a lot of knowledge that has been shared on this podcast. And for this to be able to become part of our tool belt is to actually really sit with them and marinate with the wisdom that has been shared so that it can, um, or the knowledge that has been shared, so it can actually start to be integrated into everyday life, into the every conversations, into your morning practice, how you choose to breathe what you know you're choosing to surround yourself with and that's when this knowledge will start to become wisdom as the essence of who you are and that's the power of integration so um Hala, thank you so much for just sharing your magic Love you. <laughs> so fun like this just, time just goes like this I, I actually before the podcast asked Chelsea, um, my wizard, works for, for a production company. And um, as dear sister of mine, and you know Chelsea from season two, um, I asked her to actually twerk when it was at 55, <laughs> I 55 didn't minutes see it. in. Did you get I, it? Did, oh, I got it. Did you didn't see <sighs> it? She's it. over your left shoulder. Okay. Oh, she went in. Yeah, she was, she was like, me. and she made eye contact with me and she kept shaking. <laughs> like, and I was like, <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> this is the kind of environment I want to live in. You know, like, this is the kind of people that like, I want to work with. Got the avatar tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're out here vibe. just having deep conversations and, you know, behind the scenes, people are twerking and you don't even know that that happened until now. So, yeah, it's all in silence. <laughs> Um, do you, uh, how are people going to find you if they really resonate with you, want to continue to follow your journey with O2 Awakening and, um, uh, which is your, your breathwork company. Yeah, you can find beloved. us Awaken Breathwork or awaken.com. That's awaken with an O. And then you can find us on Instagram, my Instagram, Hella, it's with an E, H-E-L-L-E. I'm sure you'll find it in the show Actually, notes. Actually, Hella Cool. I am Hella Cool. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you can find us there. Instagram, website, they're the main spots with, that we are active. Perfect. And I would love to connect with people. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's beautiful to witness your, you know, you, fe- you film like the morning practices and um, and you film your, you know, your breath work and all of the different things. So um, it's really lovely to follow along with your journey and uh, the wisdom that you instill um, on those platforms. So definitely go ahead and do yourself a favor and check out that. Um, Hala online and all of the things and follow on the journey um and all of the information will also be in the show notes thank you mama appreciate you so much the greatest gift you can ever offer is your time and your presence and for making the drive up here and um for being with me today i'm so grateful it's just the beginning oh yeah baby lifelong mission we're gonna be old ladies (laughs) i mean it's it's not a season it's a life's work that's for sure exactly um, to all of you beautiful humans, thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Deja Vu Podcast. If you resonate with today's episode, then feel free to share it on your Instagram stories, your highlights, um, and allow others to be able to tap into this. If also you feel like somebody can really benefit from this wisdom that's been shared today, that you know a HSP yourself, or you are a highly sensitive person yourself, and you feel like this wisdom can be really supportive to others, then I, my invitation for you is to send it over to those people and to pop it into their, slide into their DMs with a little Deja Vu Podcast episode with Hello West. Um, and uh, thank you so much for tuning in until next week sending you so much love and may you have more tools to be able to integrate into your being as you navigate some denser spaces while keeping your sensitivity raised and not losing your center it is a jungle out there fam but we are doing the best that we can and we are sharing the wisdom that has supported us to be able to navigate being human until next week sending you love
Today's sponsor of this podcast is Becoming Prosperous, which is a four-week online self-guided course aligning you with what it truly means to live a prosperous life. So if you want to check out the link, it's in the show notes here on YouTube and also on all podcasting Audible platforms.